Welcome back to the program. It is Tuesday night. It is front row material now. Just got done with a great episode of Future Stars Now. If you happen to miss our amazing interview, uh, you definitely go ahead and get a chance to catch it once we go off the air. Uh, Johnny Moran was awesome. Uh, I told some great stories, and uh, we're definitely going to have him back again. Man, I'm just wondering, our next guest is probably, after seeing that commercial that we played, probably thinking, what the hell did I get myself into? Yeah. No, I'm with you. This next guy is scary. Scary, but in a good way. The guy's got an incredible look, um, has had an incredible wrestling career so far, and I am so excited to be able to go ahead and talk to him and introduce him to our audience as well. So let's go ahead and let's bring him on right now. Welcome to the program. This is Gray Wolf Raventhorn. How are you doing tonight, buddy? I'm well. Really, really amused by your music video, I must say. Very it amazing. is. I almost feel I should have had a part for that. I'm too sexy for my hood. Too sexy for my hood. Isn't <laughs> that good? I, I think I that would have worked very well. Uh, first of all, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing well. Relaxing. Sort of a stressful, rough day, but getting to relax a little bit. So doing much better. Always good. Have a good meal. Sit down a little bit and sort of unwind. Well, you know, I was doing research and obviously I've watched uh, a lot of different things that you've been in and your wrestling career has been amazing so far. Um, you, you definitely have a style and a presence that is unique in, in a world where there are a lot of people who are different versions of other people. You have a very unique look and it's very intimidating. Um, I'm sure that there's a lot of people who walk up to you that say, whoa, wait a second. <laughs> you say, ironically, you say walk up to me. Usually it's, oh, wait a second, they walk the other way. So that's really, <laughs> they don't want to approach me. No, the fans are really good. The fans are, you know, during intermissions, I usually talk to several fans. So I like to engage with them quite a bit. Um, but yes, I, I try to remain distinct. I, I feel that we as wrestlers are not just performers in the sense that we use our bodies as a mechanism for which to express ourselves, but in the fact that we are very artists to our very core. I mean, to express ourselves via professional wrestling medium is a craft, and mm -hmm. within every craft is an art. You master the craft and express yourself via the vehicle of the craft through your art, and the art is your expression. So I feel like in being an artist as I am, this is also how I express myself. So I try to bring something unique and something different, for artists are creators. And I try to bring something in this, into this world as an extension of myself that maybe nobody has seen yet. So if I see something that's too mundane or too oversaturated, I often try to deter my creative vision from that direction and craft something completely anew, which other people can model and, and you know, have influence and perhaps breathe life into their own creativity through the mechanism of the vehicle I provide for them via my own creative entity. You come across as a very deep intellectual thinker when it comes to a lot of things, and it seems like you also incorporate a lot of that uh, into what you do as well in the ring. So I guess kind of right off the bat, a, a general question would be, sure. what made you decide to use the world of professional wrestling as your canvas? Well, if you follow um, much of my work, um, this is just the one I I have a great passion for it. Um, a sort of live theater and art and the ability to express yourself with your body and do that. But I, what I do extends beyond just the media of the professional wrestling world. I was, um, had a classical education as an artist, uh, specifically Renaissance painting and sculpture. Um, I've done a little bit of poetry. I've done wood carving. Um, I've done some music. I've composed. I do graphic design, a little bit of photography here and there. I, I sort of um, Any sort of art and crafts, anything I get my hands on really, that sort of engages me in the moment. Um, strange fact, a few people know this. If I wasn't a professional wrestler, I likely would have been a musician. So I sort of find myself uh, encapsulated by many different art forms. This one seems to be the one I was about which I was most passionate and really could thrust myself with the fullness of my being and feel that I could give something to it that has maybe never been given before. What do you feel like when you're in the ring that allows you con to connect the most with the fans? Is there one aspect or is it the whole package um, that makes you feel like you are connecting with your audience uh, at any moment? 
That's a good question. It's an interesting question. How would I describe it? It's almost as if there are swirls of energy um, sort of just going about the room and you sort of tap into that energy and you feel it when you make eye contact with somebody. And when you make eye contact, you can almost feel the emotion that's deep within them and they can feel the emotion that's being projected from you. And I think once you make that contact, it's, it's like the swirls of energy all around it just become one with you and you become one with that energy and it just bolsters that which you're already doing. I mean, they could, they've said, you know, you'd rather have be wrestling in front of five fans that are raucous and rowdy than 5,000 that are sitting on their hands. And I fully believe that because when they're raucous and rowdy and they're really passionately engaged with you, it's almost like music. You're creating music. You're creating poetry. You're engaging with your crowd and you're creating something beautiful and you're connecting in that way. So I think once I establish that connection and I can really feel that energy, it's almost like they're giving it to you. You know, whether you're a baby face and you're a good guy, you know, clapping your hands and they're shouting your name, you just channel that energy and funnel it through yourself into an extension of what you're doing. Or as a heel, they're giving you a different energy, but it's energy nonetheless that you can again funnel and focus and bring forth and give back to them fully. So it's almost like cyclical patterns of recipro reciprocating energy back and forth. And it's this beautiful um, sort of symphony, I feel. Uh, that you create with your fans when you're there. They often say that in sports, specifically football, because we're in that season right now, the fan is the 12th man on the field. You know, and I also have been a big believer in the fans are actually another part or they're an extension of the match itself because so much of what you do is based upon how they respond and vice versa. Um, can you describe what that's like when you are in an atmosphere where it is a big time match and you haven't even touched yet, but you can just look around, you pan the room or the, the arena and you just all of a sudden get this, this jolt of energy that you may not have had even prior to coming through the curtain. I'm sorry. What's the frame of the question? I, I seem well, like more of a, what, what, what's that like as far as being able to give you just that little extra Oh, it's it's phenomenal, um, and it, it's almost function like a ripple effect, like throwing a big stone into a pond. Sometimes it's quiet, and all it takes is looking out or hearing that one person, and they start going. And then the person next to them starts going, and then the person across the room from them starts going, and then you have this just cacophony of noise and passion that you can draw from, and it can change something in an instant. I mean, I've gone out there conversely, and been in matches where I thought everything was good that what we were doing but nobody seemed to be responding and that's it's hard when you're in front of a crowd like that you're giving it everything you have and it just seems to almost nullify that passion within you when you're doing all your best and nobody seems to be responding but even if that one person responds or if that a few people respond then you know you've connected and it sort of refreshes you anew and gives you new breathes new life it gives you a new beginning and can really give you that jolt give that extra just ounce of energy that deep give something a little bit more than you had before. You know, it's like when maybe an opera singer or, you know, guitarist hits that high note, you know, the national anthem is a good one, you know, and the rock is red glad you hear them ascend to the ceiling with a high note and with such passion and draw, and the audience responds to that, and viscerally, the musician naturally responds in turn by giving more energy that the audience has given them. Because they say, you know, energy never never retires and never dies. It just changes form. And I believe that is so in a metaphorical sense as well when it comes to the wrestling business. That the energy never sort of dies. And once it's there, it just sort of changes forms. It metamorphosizes into something different, which we can give back. Do you, looking back on your career so far, do you know uh, or can recollect a moment uh, or a match where it was just that. It was the perfect storm. It was the perfect storm of emotions. The the fans were in it from the beginning to the end, and it was something that you consider one of your greatest works. Well, that's a difficult question. Um, I know there was one in particular, and I don't think it was my best match per se, as far as the chemistry being there, it, the the moves were. It's it was sort of you know it was like listening to a um, song with an out of tune instrument almost. I feel. But imagine somebody loving that song so much that everybody's into it. And it doesn't matter how it sounds. Everybody just has such passion. This is um, a match in Delaware a few years ago for uh, a title called the Valhalla Vision's title. 
and it was against a good friend of mine. I'd known him several years from when I'd gotten the wrestling business. Um, and maybe my first or second year in, I'd met him. His name Matt Wilde. And he was holding the Valhalla Vision's title. And the next thing we know, you know, all the people are surrounding the ring. All the boys from the back are surrounding the ring. And he shoot changes the finish on me. And oh, whoa. Once unbeknownst to me, I put him in a submission hold and he tapped out and says, um, congratulations. And sort of all the boys from the back were there and they were clapping and applauding. And I was almost, you know, legitimately in tears because I was so surprised this happened. Now, the history behind the Valhalla Vision's title is there's someone I'd like to give a personal shout out to. Um, it's just a phenomenal human being. Robbie Blizzard is the curator of this Valhalla Vision's title. So, Robbie, if you happen to be listening or listen back to this, this is for you and I appreciate you. Um, his band is, band is called Valhalla Visions. You know, he has all sorts of shirts, all sorts of merchandise. Um, which I recommend uh, checking out if you get a chance. Um, he's the one who had presented this belt and developed this belt. And it was a traveling title from promotion to promotion. And he only felt it should be bestowed on the most worthy person that could have it. And I expected to go in and put over Matt Wilde that night. And having changed the finish, and unbeknownst to myself, all the boys in the back knew after I had already gone out to the ring that, you know, what was going to happen. And so at the end of that, you know, I, I just... All that they came into the ring and they're all applauding and it was just a very very um the match itself is it's a little lackluster but the moment itself that we created there because it was a moment of pure passion it was a moment um of pure emotion it was something organic and genuine that didn't have to be scripted or rehearsed or planned um it was just something we brought into the ether in the moment and everybody responded beautifully to it and us as well it was a very emotional moment for everyone involved would you also agree that sometimes a great match doesn't necessarily have to encapsulate great moves or, you know, from a technical standpoint, but as long as the audience was engaged and you told them the story and they went on that ride with you, obviously as a professional, you do want to have everything to be crisp and everything work um, just the way you had imagined it or had imagined it in your mind, but do you still think sometimes the emotion can actually transcend what physicality happened in the match and it can make a match that would have been so-so actually really great? You know, I feel that um, we tie ourselves too much to what we predetermine and what we rehearse and what we feel like we have in our mind, but then we dismiss, in a sense, and omit from the realm of possibility the organic influence again going back to the crowd and they play an integral part if they're not responding to something in a specific way we have to change it instantaneously so they do respond in the way that we would rather than do it and we can't predict that sometimes because crowds can be fickle and sometimes you don't know exactly who might be in the crowd and who might be influencing what or what they may have seen previously that might have been. there's a number of things that alter this the mindset and state of being um classic example though um there, there's i've seen so many five-star matches with you know t from a technical advantage where people's moves are tight and crisp and nobody cared um and then i like to bring to the forefront obviously my probably i, I consider the best match of all time for the reasons uh, you've enumerated already hogan andre from a technical standpoint it was it was an amateur throwaway match on a mid-card level on a house show yep from an emotional buildup and from a storytelling perspective and from the fans that were invested in how they were invested in every breath that these wrestlers took, it, it can't be replicated. Another one, I, I like to use Hogan as an example because he's, I feel like he was a master of his craft, even though he gets uh, dismissed quite a few times, especially by people in the internet generation. Oh, he couldn't work. No, he could, he could point a finger and have someone back off and the crowd would erupt into, uh, into a sea of uh, cheers just by raising his finger that's how that's usually how do you distinguish a worker not whether he could do a 360 or 450 moonsault or the, it was any sort of you know flippy tiger or, name it any silly move um that's the method of a worker that has people so engaged that everything you say and everything you do at the tip of a finger can be manipulated and you manipulate their emotions thusly and i, I just feel that from that perspective hogan andre was probably the best match of all time. And then the second, um, my personal favorite, which is arguable, um, Hogan Rock, WrestleMania 18. Again, Ooh. another absolute masterpiece where the crowds were invested in every single thing they did. They turned their heads either way. 
and they looked at each other, and people jumped to their feet. Yeah, that is, uh, that is a sign of a master there. You know, you talked uh, about some people that you had worked with, and and you really had enjoyed, and and you gave a shout out. Are there other people that you also have worked with in the past um, that you look at in in you look at the body of work you've created with them and you say, man, it's just, it's just chemistry. It's just gold. It's one of these things that we don't really have to say a whole lot to each other. It's just, like you said before, it's very organic. It's just very natural. It's, it's very much a dance. Is there anybody else that you feel like happens when you step in the ring all of a sudden oh, it's just, absolutely. let's dance. Someone I've been feuding with for over a decade off and on through several promotions through several different states. Um, the vampire that blasted, damned, bloody, filthy, stinking, putrid, decaying, undead piece of filth. I must pay homage to the vamp king, Kindred Kamari. Now, as you know, you know, in literature and fiction and lore, the vampire and the uh, the werewolf and the wolf just, you know, are in constant turmoil with one another. Well, so it has been for over a decade with Kindred and myself. And we've had a no disqualification matches, for no falls count anywhere matches, um, just title matches, right? just regular matches. We've had so many matches over the years, but every time I step in the ring with uh, Kindred Kamari, I just feel like magic happens. And I just feel like we don't really need to say much. We don't need to do much. We're both sort of on the same page with one another. And we beat the bloody hell out of each other. And that's a shoot. We, we, we really beat each other up. And we go back, I hug him afterwards, and I'll see, I say, I'll see you next time I beat you up. And it's it's just how, it, how it's been going for years, and I don't think that's a feud that'll ever end, and I hope it doesn't. Because I'm, oh, I never get tired of um, bludgeoning the bloody bat, uh, Kindred Kimari. So yes, he's, he's definitely uh, one example. He's the first example that comes to my mind. Um, another one, and I, I, it's someone I haven't seen, nor have I, um, Wrestled in quite some time. The last time I did was at a training session at Ring of Honor. It was um, Brian Johnson? What he called himself now? I think believe he calls himself the Mecca. Brian Johnson from uh, Ring of Honor right now. Um, somebody that's uh, insanely talented on so many levels. Who I just I came up with him. I believe he started a few months in the business before I did. He was just getting there as I was arriving. We had the same trainer, same facility. We had wrestled together for years. And we'd had a several year lull where we hadn't seen each other. And um, I remember picking up after not having seen him and he just transformed his body completely. And he was cutting promos that were just out of this world, outrageously unbelievable. And getting in the ring with him at Ring of Honor, it was just like we had never missed a step. Um, and I believe it's just from having trained together so long and just you know, there's things that we would do and things that we would have to say a word. Uh, one of the things he always liked to do to me was give me a snap mail, lick his hand, and smack my bald head. I don't know why he did it, but he still does it to this day when I see him. Um, but no, props to him, because every time I step in the ring with him, it's, sort of, uh, it's just a remarkable chemistry. Um, it's sort of indescribable. But I guess they were the sort of ring brothers, I guess you could say. So, Brian, you're watching. Congratulations on where you are and what you're doing. I'm very impressed. I'm very proud of you. It's so interesting you bring up uh, training, because training has been a very big part of your career, um, you obviously have a ph phenomenal physique. Um, bodybuilding, powerlifting, all of these kinds of things yep. are uh, credits to you. And not only from the standpoint of of what your your body has become, the final product, but it also instills a lot of discipline as well. And it takes a lot of mental um, energy to be, be focused on stuff like this. So. What first kind of got you enthralled with the world of bodybuilding and um, how did that dovetail into powerlifting or maybe that happened vice versa? That's an interesting question. Uh, strangely, um, when I was a youth, I got my first weight set because I knew if you wanted to be a professional wrestler, you needed to be big and you needed to be strong. So the first thing I wanted to do was to start lifting weights. And I sort of clumsily uh, uh, stammered about, you know, doing what I thought I knew without any real direction. Um, and then I had, um, at one point joined an old bodybuilding gym called Manuel's gym, sort of a hole in the wall in Trenton, New Jersey, um, right in a little polo section off, the uh, off, uh, main strip there, it's a very small gym. Everything was sort of round shackle falling apart. And I loved every minute of it. It was a gym specifically for bodybuilders. And the man who owned it, his name was Joe Dodd. He was like a surrogate father to me. I, I, you know, rest, rest his soul as it may, um. So I began training there within a few 
within a few uh, weeks, I began with a trainer there. Now, you, you, when you think trainer, in today's sort of terms, you think of fitness center person with a big smile across their face, grinning deeply, you know, with his probably has, you know, eats his avocados and maybe weighs 180 pounds with his nice <laughs> fit. Yeah, no, 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 no. The person that trained me um, originally was a man, he's about five foot six, but his trapezius muscles came up to his ears. Um, he had a completely tattooed head, a big white beard, and gauges all over his ears, and he'd scream at people. You'd think he'd have a position as a drill sergeant, but they, he'd probably scare them as well. I remember I said, that's the man who's going to train. And I sort of got into bodybuilding, and this is, I went started going to the gym because I wanted to be a professional wrestler. I completely, from that time, transformed my physique with the next year through discipline of training and diet and, and just conditioning myself to a completely different lifestyle. Um, and Joe Dodd, the man who owned it, as I said, like a surrogate father to me, he sort of became my primary mentor in the world of bodybuilding. So I started looking good, and everybody there was a bodybuilder. It's like, oh, well, you're looking good. Why don't you, you know, start doing the bodybuilding? So, and the next thing you know, I'm in a pad of nothing but a pad of small trunks, and I'm on a bodybuilding stage with a big smile on my face, hitting different poses. You know, uh, so that was very, very early on. And then later on, it's just sort of a long, long road. I've done, done body, did bodybuilding for several years. Later on, I began tr making friends with someone there who was the powerlifter. And there was an entire powerlifting team. So I had many powerlifting friends, but I began specifically training with a powerlifter who um, was a member there as well. And he's uh, uh, strangely, he became a wrestler. His name is uh, Steven Zima. I believe he wrestles somewhere under the gargantuan. Um, I'm not sure which circuit. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen him for quite some time. He sets all you know, different powerlifting records and. I had done powerlifting, powerlifting meets with him. I never competed. I was trained to compete for a myriad of reasons. It just never came to fruition. But I was always backstage with him, training like a powerlifter with him and setting numbers. You know, um, before I'd injured my knee in 2016, I was deadlifting 700 pounds. I was um, bench pressing. I, I began injuring my chest. I mean, I used to bench press um, 400 pounds, you know, four or five, four sets of 10. Um, after a few injuries, you know, I went down. I don't do more than three fifteen now. Before I hurt myself, it was I was doing uh, three fifteen for sets of thirty. You know, deadlifting or squatting. You know, um, five eighty five for say sets of six to eight. So these these are sort of the numbers I was I was doing, but I never actually had competed. Um, I also did strongman because he did strongman as well. So I'd gone backstage with strongman and, and trained sort of for that a little bit as well. So I, I sort of trained in all sorts of different ways. And then it just led, I eventually followed my path as a professional wrestler with this as my background, which I feel has been very beneficial to me and sort of put me ahead of the curve a little bit as it is um, because I've developed my body in such a way that it stands out a bit more. It's interesting you mentioned bodybuilding and, and powerlifting and, and strongman competitions because uh, Bill Kazmaier, who yep. a guy who I absolutely love not only to watch him do what he does in his sport, which is something that less than 1% of people can do. Uh, and that may even be high, uh, maybe a half of a half of a percent. But just the knowledge that goes into that in all of the preparation that goes into powerlifting and how to do this and that and the Atlas Stone and all that kind of stuff with the strongman. Uh, but he also did uh, WCW as well. He, did. he actually. Yeah, he did that as well, and I thought that was super, super awesome. And, and was. if anybody has ever heard him speak, he is probably one of the most genuine, sweet, kind-hearted men, um, great public speaker. But it's just when you talk about that, it, it did make me recollect people who've also gone that road as well and uh, who have succeeded and done very well. So uh, definitely you're in, a, you're in the pantheon of some, some very elite people when it comes to uh, the sports world. Oh, thank you. I, I I try. I put my effort in and I just, I, I do my best and I just hit the best results from the effort I put in. What were some people or who were some people, I should say, who might have given you some advice along the way uh, when it came to wrestling? You, you first get into it, obviously, you're doing the bodybuilding thing, you're chiseled out of granite, uh, you're doing the shows. Years later, obviously, powerlifting and whatnot, you, you have the physique, you have the mental toughness, and then you decide to go into pro wrestling. Was there anybody at any point, maybe earlier in your career, uh, when you were training, maybe later uh, in your career, that said, hey, I want to tell you something, or you got a second, I want to share something with you. Anybody who ever had one of those one-off moments with you, uh, either backstage or at a training session that gave you some things to think about? 
you know, I, I fear answering that question, not because I failed to come up with an answer, but because I have so many that I fear leaving someone out. Um, there, there's been so many along the way. It's been it'll be 16 years next month that I've been in the business. And I mean, to start off, I, my original trainer at Atlas, you know, sort of at the monster, he was running the monster factory at the time under the um, supervision sort of of Larry Sharp. So he was the primary trainer there, along with Jim Molyneux from ECW. Mm -hmm. um, the majority of my fundamentals you know, obviously came from Ed Atlas. And Ed Atlas could be crazy, um, but he had a lot of knowledge to give. And Jim Molyneux was, you could just sit and listen, listen to him speak wisdom for hours on end and just listen and absorb. And I, Jim Molyneux, I don't think, knows how integral he's been to some of my philosophies on the business and my approach to the business and just my some of the things I know just from listening to him speak, even though Ed Atlas was the dominating, it was funny, we, it was the dominating dad voice at the Monster Factory, and Jim was sort of mom. He was in a much quieter, more reserved, but there's so much knowledge that he shared along the way. And I just, I don't want to name drop. I mean, there's just there's so many names that have helped me along the way. I remember uh, early on, Axel Rotten, I'd pull up a chair besides him in the locker room, he'd help me out, um, just listening to people like Tom Brandy, uh, um, Danny Cage, who runs the Monster Factory now, always has bits of wisdom. He's like my Monster Factory brother, I feel. Um, so I've, I've gained so much from him and just listening to people like, uh, like um, Les Thatcher would come along. Two of my big influences, and I can't thank them enough. Um, Bob Evans, beautiful Bob Evans. Um, I've done so much. I hosted seminars alongside of him because he trusted me enough to help with the students. And um, also Kevin Kelly, who would also do seminars with Bob. I just learned such a fountain of knowledge um, just to listen to these men. You know, I, I think I mentioned Tom Tom Brandy, who you mm -hmm. know, I would sit beside him, uh, listen to Tito Santana a little bit, who he would just kind of just talk, and I would I would listen. Uh, Coco Beware was another one. Uh, I'm just there, there was so many. I just I feel that if I be, keep naming, I'm just going to um, I'm just going to forget to name people and that's that's my biggest fear um one more esoteric one people might not know as much uh but i really want to give a little uh knowledge to here hangman harley watkins now if you're familiar with him he would he had done some jobs back in wcw back in the 90s and he would pull a chair next to me because he knew i wanted to learn he knew i wanted to listen this was a little early in my career and he would just look me in the eyes and tell me everything i did wrong everything i need to know everything that was bad about myself in the most caring way possible because he wanted me to get better and I would just listen to any knowledge he had to give. Um, then there were times where I would, um, we would all go out to eat after different um, events and I just remember sitting next to, you know, on the table next to Jack Molson, um, who's another one who I don't, why he wasn't never ever signed with him and his brother, I, I it's beyond me. Uh, there were massive individuals. Molson at one point was, I think he's six five and weighed five hundred pounds, and both of them, him and his brother, were impressive and could work. And his his brother was about six three, three hundred forty pounds or three hundred fifty pounds. He might have been up to four hundred at one point. He was enormous, and he was also a power lifter who had set records. So I, why they were never signed, I just I can't even wrap my head around it. But I remember just again sitting there and absorbing, you know, as we were out to dinner, and we'd go out to dinner, you know, a couple times a month together because we were working the same circuits, and I would just sit and listen to Molson talk, and you know pick his brains and just learn whatever I could. He was training people at one time at the Wild Samoans Academy. So he really had a lot of knowledge and I gained a lot from him. And just other, just so many, so many people around. Another one, um, Delirious from Ring of Honor. He was always mm -hmm. so good. And if anyone has the opportunity to train on him, he's one of the most phenomenal minds I think I've met in the business. Um, you know, for years I was convinced Star Wars was fiction. Until I met Delirious and I said, this man... This man is a real life Jedi. There's no question about it. This man's a real life Jedi. He's he's Obi Wan Kenobi. He's Qui Gon Jinn. Um, just the amount of knowledge he's had and the willingness to share it and the things he can do is are remarkable. Um, so he's another one. And I, I I could go on and on um, naming different people, but again, I fear leaving people out. But those are some of the main influences I've had. Um, they've really taken the time to get my um, Jay Briscoe was another one. I want to give a small nod to also Jay Briscoe for helping me out in a certain way when I was first um, approaching Ring of Honor. So thank you also to Jay Briscoe. Um, but so many, so many people. Cheeseburger was showing me moves outside of um, my repertoire because he knows I think every move known to man and he's a technical genius. If no, I don't think he gets enough credit for being as good as he is. 
Um, perhaps he doesn't flaunt it enough technically, but he's an absolute master. Every time I'm around him, I learn about five moves I've never heard before and can't pronounce the names because they're in different languages. <laughs> so not also to him as well. We have, uh, you know, I say this phrase a lot on the show, the six degrees of Kevin Bacon. And yes. uh, it, the funny thing is you mentioned Les Thatcher and, and people on the show know I've, I've mentioned this. I first got involved with wrestling when I was in high school. Um, so we're talking in the <coughs> mid to late 90s. And uh, I went ahead and I went down to HWA, uh, which was known at the time as Heartland Wrestling Association. Sure. And I got to know Les and... Phenomenal human being. I could not even begin to tell you how he welcomed me into his office. And I was just a high school kid. And I said, what can I do to help? And I think those are the words that people look for, yes, you know, okay. instead of, you know, oh, can I get autographs or who can you introduce me to? I said, how can I help? And yep. we co-promoted an event together. I helped find a, a venue Fantastic. and I was so thrilled for that. And, um, so many different guys who came through HWA and that was such a successful promotion and Les gave his heart and soul. And I'm so glad to see he's doing so well these days and he deserves yep. all the accolades because he's one of those people who will literally sit down with you and give you a heart to heart and you will be 10 times the person you were before you walked into the room after you leave talking with Les. Absolutely. Um, and, and he gives up himself selflessly. I, I asking nothing in return and and you, you see in him um a genuine love for the business a genuine passion for the business and, and i feel like especially people who have been around it quite a while they get jaded and it's nice especially to see somebody who's up there i remember um jimmy snooker is another one that i just remember every time i saw him he was so full of life this was and roddy piper even when i had met roddy piper i only had the uh, privilege of meeting him once but i remember him just being so full of life and so vibrant just happy to still be around the business. And I feel like there's so many that just uh, do it as a job or want to collect the payday or have other motives and, and to see the genuine desire to be around the business and the happiness that it brings and the joy that it creates. It's just a wonderful thing. And I feel like it, uh, you draw off of that and you, you really, you see him become excited. I remember one time having a professor when I was studying art, who, um, he would educate you using slides and you'd do slideshows and he didn't care if anyone was listening. He loved his artwork so much and he loved what he did so much that he would just talk and talk for hours and just, you'd see him smile about little things. And it was, um, it's a really fantastic thing to, uh, to behold. And you really became passionate about something you might not even care about just because you heard him talking so much about how much he cared about it and how much joy it brought him that it, subsequently um, brought you joy vicariously, even if you couldn't understand it or you didn't particularly relate to it yourself. So I, I feel like there's a lot of that in Les that he just brings that much joy to the wrestling business. I like the way that you use the word vicariously because I think that is, in some ways, the beauty of what pro wrestling is. It's, it's the sure. fact that we, uh, the people on the other side of the rail, get the ability to live vicariously through these larger-than-life uh, individuals, um, these mystical creatures and things that we get a chance to believe in. And when you believe in something, it becomes a part of you and you get to see yourself in them. And it just takes you on a journey and it not only takes you through, man, I love to see, you know, my favorite person win, but it also, it, it teaches you a lesson as well throughout the whole process. I remember Hulk, Hulk Hogan made a statement. He said, Tara Balea was a three on a scale one to 10 as a human being. He said, but Hulk Hogan made me a 10 out of 10 and it changes you. So I guess, I think it's awesome for fans to get to live vicariously, but maybe a, a part two to that question is how has being in wrestling changed you as a person? That's a, that's a deep, deep um, question. I don't know that I've ever thought about that. Um, to comment on your first um, sort of point, I speak a lot to my fans and I try to interact. I try to be available to them as much as I can because at the end of the day, they're also people. And I feel like too many wrestlers take with too many entertainers. I don't want to narrow it down and make it exclusive to wrestlers. So many entertainers um, have a disconnect and forget that there's a person behind everybody like in their status or, or you know, 
buying the t-shirt or purchasing a ticket that there's a person behind that. So I try to get to know the people behind the uh, avatars, as it would be, um, as much as I can. And I see, you know, a lot of them talk about, you know, comic books. And I, I don't understand comic books. It's not uh, something that enthralls me. I can't really connect to it. But see the other ways in which people I know connect to you know, comic book characters or, or character in a movie. How many times do you see somebody with like a Batman tattoo you know, on, uh, on them or, you know, the, the Hulk or the Superman's another logo you often see, you know, encrusted on somebody's shoulder or bicep or, or what have you. But in some way, there's a reflection of themselves in that character. There's something about that character that they see that they can connect to that makes them say, I could vicariously be that character. That character is a part of me. That person is a part of me. And I think it even extends to musicians as well. How many times do you see people with band tattoos? You know, the Kiss tattoo is, you know, on all, you know, I think on all the Metallica M's, you know, the, the star M's. I've seen that quite a few times. There's something about it that relates to you and you feel relatable. And I definitely feel that with some of my fans. I feel like sometimes that's a connection that we have that they might not be the entire entity that I am but they connect to it in some way. Even, and that's what I try to relate to them as well, that you have the power within yourself to be anything that you want to be, to be that entirety of yourself. You know, they said wrestlers are themselves cranked up to 10. You know, take yourself, whatever you do, and crank it up to 11. There's no reason you can't. And I feel a lot of people don't believe in themselves enough to do it. But if you look to classicism, if you look to any of the um, sort of gods of the past, um, you know, Ares or, or, or Isis or Cyrus or Zeus, Heracles, you know, any of these gods sort of embodied something. They were the embodiment, you know, Ares, the god of war, you know, Poseidon, the god of this, everything about them was that entirety. And I feel like we become an emblem like that. But I'd like to let people know that they themselves can become that emblem, can become a character, caricature of something larger than themselves. But maybe that is what they see, is they see part of us within themselves and they extend that out. Um, so, um, I'm sorry, I got I digressed. Um, what was the the second part of the question? I sort of no, no, no. You're fine. Uh, it was just kind of, you know, how has wrestling changed changed you? Thinking. Well, for the most fundamental, obvious, conspicuous part of it, sometimes I walk with a bit of a limp. Sometimes I'm holding my back. Uh, from a physical perspective, it's changed me quite a bit. Sometimes it hurts to get out of bed. Sometimes I can't get out of bed. Um, I think we all grow as individuals along the way from everything we experience. And wrestling has shown me a lot of, lot, a lot of bad. And from all the bad I've seen, I try my best every day not to be that. Um, because I've seen people hurt people deliberately in different, not just in the ring, but in different ways. And, and I, 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 you know, fa- wrestlers turn away from fans and not want anything to do with that and just things that I don't want to mention. So I don't, I look to that and I say, hmm, I don't want to be that. So I try to enhance myself in such a way that I'm not. And also, I see so much good. And we talk like people, uh, people like Les Thatcher, we talk about Bob Evans, and there are people that I see that are remarkable, both in a physical way, in an athletic way. And I say, how can I ascend as a human being to that? So I feel like everything we experience has influence upon us, um, whether directly or indirectly, consciously, subconsciously. And I feel everything we do, we have a decision within that context. Like, I want to do this. And I feel it's made me evolve into such a person, finding the person I don't want to be and trying not to be that, and finding everything through others that I do want to be and trying to trot down that path. I, and I can't say because I don't know how to have been in a different business where I'd be what my philosophies on things might be or how they might have changed things. Um, but it's been an experience I wouldn't trade for the world. And one I would gladly repeat if given another opportunity. So, I mean, we're, we're coming on 16 years in the industry, which is an eternity. I mean, just from everything that you've put your, your body through. Um, and you say you, you do it all over again. And I believe that with every fiber in my being. So let me ask you, What's the next chapter going to look like? What is the next page that's going to be written look like? Is it something that you have an idea already, or is it something 
much like your matches. What makes a great match makes a great next chapter in my life. It's just going to have to happen organically. Yeah, I like that you use that analogy, and I'm no I'm no prognosticator, nor am I a soothsayer or an oracle, so I can't tell for certain. Though I have an idea, I try to build things in my mind, almost structure them as you would write a book. And because I use the book analogy all the time, and I said you're the author of your own destiny, you can always can't rewrite the past, but you can always rewrite the ending. And I'd like to say that I will be signed to a major TV company. That's the that's the goal. I, I like to set goals. I don't like to fancy wishes. Because um, I feel like when you wish for something, you're rolling a dice and taking a gamble on chance that all the stars might align and things go your way. However, when you set goals, even small ones, you have a determined path. And I tell people that when it comes to goal setting, have your macro goal, the, the, the big one, the, you know, the one you ultimately like to achieve, and have it big. Because it's not big, you'll settle for less, and you don't want to settle for less. But also along the way, have small goals and celebrate those goals. Because if you think about a bowl of rice, a bowl of rice is a bowl of rice. A grain in a bowl of rice is nothing. But if one day you have a grain, and the second day you add a grain, maybe the next day you had two grains, or the next day maybe one the next, in any sequence, by the end of the time, you look back and you have a bowl of rice. Mm -hmm. Because everything, every goal matters, and everything accumulates one atop the other. So when they do, you've reached that macro goal by achieving the micro goals. So I always say, have the macro goal in mind. Keep plugging away daily, even if it's a small improvement. And that's what I encourage people to do. And I really feel if there's any takeaway from anyone watching, um, the takeaway this, that every day improve something. Every day do something small. Every day learn a new word. You know, Go the extra 20 feet for your, for your morning walk. Uh, add another minute to your yoga. Whatever it is, you know, cut cut the soda out for the day. You know, drink more, drink another glass of water. Whatever the small goal is, and make it consistent. First, set that goal, accomplish that goal, and reward yourself. Don't be afraid to reward yourself for goals because that triggers a mechanism within your mind that accomplishing a goal equates to a reward. But set those goals every day. Try to do something small, it's just something. Even if you have trouble getting out of bed, and you get out of bed that one minute earlier. The next day, it's two minutes earlier. And compound those goals on top of each other because every goal is a victory and every victory is a win. And those wins are all something you tally up in the long run. And you'll see that once you have that many wins, it really accumulates into something much bigger. You know, some people say, oh, well, uh, I want to lose 50 pounds. And, you know, they eat clean for two days. And, oh, I haven't lost 50 pounds. I quit. No, that's not how this works at all. They're, they're, they're absolutely not. No, set a macro goal of 50 pounds. And then say, by the end of this month, I want to have lost 50. Maybe by the end of the next one, you want to swap. By the, before you know it, you'll get more disciplined because you'll celebrate the small goals and take those small goals because those victories, the smaller victories are bigger than the big victory because they mean more. But every day do it, and that's how you construct the discipline to do these things. And before you know it, you've accomplished something you would marvel at that you didn't think you would be able to accomplish before. So that's sort of my takeaway from, from, that, whole, uh, from that whole ramble. I mean, I, I think I'm in a similar boat with you. It's It's... If I were to surmise what we've been talking about, it's about the journey, not necessarily focusing on the destination because the destination will happen, but it won't happen unless you put forth the steps in your journey to get to where you need to be. And from what I've also learned from you, wrestling to you, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it's more of the essence of someone's being. It's something that is communally shared. It's yep. something that you can't really put trunks on or you can't uh, put a foam finger on. It's something that just, it, it you feel it. It's, it's really hard to explain, but it's something that is, it's that electric, it's that energy, and it's that moment that you share with another person or 20,000 people. It's that combined unity that everybody gets a win-win out of it, and we all feel better about ourselves from the experience. Yes, absolutely. And that's I, I recently did a, a character development workshop. I'd done several seminars before. This one really was a workshop focusing specifically on developing character and how to exude more character and incorporate character into small things that you do. Um, and one of the first things I did during my introduction was I asked, what are we selling? 
know, what are they buying? What is the, and then, you know, I get the typical answers, which I, which I'd expect. And it's a little enigmatic what I'm searching for. So I didn't expect to get it. And I, oh, the story, oh, of course we're telling a story. And that's the most primary importance is it's telling a story, correct? Oh, the move. No, we're not selling the move. The moves isn't what we're selling. The moves happen to be a sentence in the paragraph in the page on the book that we're, that we're selling. And then, and then I say, I tell them what we are selling as any great artist in any medium you know, sells in a movie, you know, you connect with them. And, and if you look at a beautiful painting or hear a beautiful piece of music, you're connecting as well. What we're selling is connection of human emotion. And that's what we're selling. We're selling an emotional experience. Now, if you ask me what's maybe my favorite moment in professional wrestling, it had nothing to do with them. Nothing to do with the character. It had the characters were important in the in the story. Um, had nothing to do with the match. It had to do with it was the ultimate warrior against Macho Man Randy Savage and had nothing to do with the match. If you recall after that match, what happened? Macho Man had lost at WrestleMania, we're talking when the one in Los Angeles, Stars and Stripes. It was the one where Shaddy turns on Oh, absolutely. It's when Liz actually comes out of the crowd and you see how he truly loved her the whole time and and how he finally tr truly showed his expressions and he wasn't this overbearing, you know, overconfident man who was truly hiding behind something, but it was somebody who actually showed raw emotion and people cried in the audience. And uh, it was, it was magic. It was a movie. And at the end of the day, no one cared about the match. Exactly. And that's probably my most favorite thing that I wanted, because what we'll be selling was selling emotion. And we connect in such a way with that story and that passion that the match almost became the moves in the match became irrelevant. But the moves in the match are usually irrelevant. I mean, if you ask somebody if you watch a match and then ask them the week later, oh, well, what was the move that they did at this point? They, they don't know. It's not about the moves, but they say, you know, oh, well, it was a half his hair match, and the man lost his hair at the end of the match. And they, they remember that with this thing's passion. You know, that they remember the story behind the match and the emotion that they felt when that story was happening. And that's really what I feel like any artist, you know, wrestling included, it, and that's what that's what it is. It's the emotion. You see a good play, you experience the same gamut of emotions that you are when you're watching a very well told wrestling called a wrestling story. And I think that's what's important is we're connecting emotionally, and that emotion is an extension of ourselves. And that, that, like you were talking about, the cyclical energy that people absorb that and they feel that, and that's really what we're connected to is the emotion behind what we do, not necessarily the medium through which we express it. Even though people have to join to different media according to their practice. I love the the example you used. Um, I'm being I'm a science guy myself, so energy is never created nor destroyed. It just simply changes form, and uh, that is so indicative of what life truly is. Nothing ends, nothing begins. It's just a new beginning in another way. Absolutely. Well, I tell you what, I have thoroughly enjoyed this very very much. Um, right. Is that. Is there any chance we could twist your arm to – well, I wouldn't try to twist your arm because I'd, I'd probably be picking myself off the ground. But uh, metaphorically speaking, uh, is there any chance we could ask you to come back again and share more uh, enlighteningness uh, when it comes to wrestling in life? Because I think our audience would love part two. Certainly. If they can bear me uh, rambling on about certain things and sort of my prattle that comes out, out of this brain of mine, sure, I'd, I'd most happily be. Well, I have definitely enjoyed it, and you have given me things to think about that it's interesting. Until you truly connect with somebody in a conversation like this, you wonder if those things rattling around in your brain is just you. But then when you hear them eloquently spoken by somebody else, it validates how you feel about something, Absolutely. and it makes you realize, oh, yeah, you know what? Someone else thinks that same way that I do, and uh, that's a pretty damn good feeling. I would agree. Well, uh, where can people follow you? Let's go ahead and let's let's get the where people can follow you. Where can people get your merchandise? Where you are going to be appearing next? What is all the sure. details? Right now, the best way to get a hold of me is through my Twitter account, TLW underscore Grey Wolf. Again, TLW underscore Grey Wolf. That's the last warrior underscore Grey Wolf, TLW underscore Grey Wolf. Um, it's the only social media I'm really using right now. It seems to be the one I'm most comfortable with. And uh, so I sort of stick to that one, but to this degree. Um, I also have a YouTube channel, which I've just been really sort of um, getting along. I'm finding my way through the jungle that is YouTube and its, and its content uh, creation. 
um, just type in Grey Wolf Raventhorn. Uh, that's Raventhorn with an E at the end of Thorn. And you'll likely find me spouting off about something ridiculous. Um, so you could follow me on there. I'd be much appreciated. I try to respond to anybody. You know, I try to respond to every comment, every message. Um, as I said before, I try to make myself readily available to anybody as within reason. Don't write me two paragraph essays or three paragraph essays when you're in my inbox. I, I don't have the energy to entertain it as much as I would like to. I was before, and it just it, there are people that would send me you know, paragraphs long messages, and I just I, I don't have time or energy to entertain that. But I will in any way help anybody I can in any way, you know any way I, I possibly can, and I try to make myself readily available. Also, will be. Uh, um, Right now, I'm really focusing on tag team wrestling with my partner. I'd like to shout out uh, Warwolf Creed. Also, give him a follow at True Warwolf um, on Twitter. That's uh, at T R U W A R W U L F on Twitter. That's my tag team partner. Our tag team name of Tyrants. Beware. We're conquering the world. That's awesome. Um, but I, merchandise is available through me. I. I Every so often, I'll post some of it. And we have T-shirts available, stickers available, eight by tens available. Um, and we'll be appearing next, I believe, November twelfth, at LTW in Ridgefield Park, New Jersey, for the tag team title. Ooh! So stay tuned for that. You know, Money Fight Inc. is the people we're facing, and we had this annoying pest in Thorn on our side, in the entity that is Boy Band, who seemed to everywhere we go interfere in our matches. By dancing, they can't seem to stop dancing. I just hope they don't try to interfere on our match this time by dancing and distracting us yet again. So be there for that. You're not going to want to miss it. And we also have engagements with uh, First Day Championship Wrestling. We, you know, uh, Outbreak Championship Re uh, Outbreak Wrestling. I believe we're going to be returning there. Um, and of course, for anybody who's been following for any duration at all knows that we've been frequenting Camp Leapfrog. Yes, we are so, big fans of Camp Leapfrog. Anyone who is familiar with, you know, the now defunct Shikara would yep. probably love Camp Leapfrog. It's probably the most fun wrestling organization I've ever worked for. Um, there's just so much going on. It, it, it's just constantly stories this direction and that direction. You don't know what, what's going to happen next, with whom, and how ridiculous and absurd it might get, and you'll if you love that style, you'll love every bit of it, as, as am I. It's just been the most fun I think I've had in the business in a breathe and relax sort of way, even though we still take our matches very serious. Well, so that's, we, that's sort of where you can find me right now. We will definitely make sure we plug those and we direct people to Camp Leapfrog to your uh, social media page as well and definitely tell people you want to get merchandise, 8x10s, go ahead, sit in a DM, but please keep it brief and... Uh, Show your love by coming out and supporting you at the shows as well, because I know the fans Absolutely. would be extremely excited to get a chance to see you. Yes, and I'd love to take it. If you'll see me at, at a wrestling event, you know, just come up and say hello. As menacing as I may seem, I always try to make time for them. I'll sign every autograph I can, um, and I'll take every photo that anyone asks for. Um, I really try to make myself as readily available as I, I, I can, because I like that return to me. If, if I was in that position, I, I feel, you know, where I want to see somebody, I, I'd want that return to me as well. So I try to think fruitful and time for every person that I can. You're a great wrestler, but you're even a better man. I thank you for your time, and we'll definitely be in touch. Okay. We'll definitely step by and do a part two. Absolutely. All very right. Much. Thank you very much for having me this evening. Thanks again. Thanks. Good you go. Wow. That was pretty cool. That was it was it was very much different than a, a traditional interview. Um, he's very passionate about what he does and he is very, um, he's a deep thinker when it comes to the psychology of wrestling. And that's a big thing that I, I wanted the audience to understand that he, you know, when we often talk about how wrestlers paint their, their masterpieces, like literally this is what he does. He is a Michelangelo. He is a Picasso. He likes to make sure that he takes people on an emotional journey that every single match, um, Maybe not necessarily has to be technically sound, but it's one of those things that he wants you to come away with having an experience. And we can't thank him for his time. And I definitely want to bring him back again. And hopefully people uh, in the chat and the people who are listening had an opportunity to enjoy some of that. Yeah, he definitely looks at things differently. Like he's more, the, the match is okay, but the emotion... And the reaction from the crowd is what he wants. 
And, you know, he brought up the great point of Hogan and Andre. I, I'm, I'm sure uh, Johnny, who we had on earlier, him and his brother probably had better matches in the basement. True. But that reaction from the crowd is what the money shot was. Yeah, absolutely. You know, ECW fan, you know, said this is one of the deepest interviews we've, we've had. And it's true. Like, in no way was I going to sit there and try to, you know, get into the flow that you two were having because I was just sitting back listening, you know, thinking about what he was saying because I'm like, wait, okay, he's saying it, you know, this way, the, the feel, the crowd reaction. I'm like, that's, that's, that's a different way to think about it. But it's true. It is. Know? Every Everybody is out there planning all these spot fests. Yep. 10, 10 minutes, 12 minutes. But then you get the, you go out there and else all of a sudden you 10 minute match, you're planning it, you know, verbatim and you get nothing. Then all of a sudden, here you go. Mr. Charisma has a little five, six minute match. And that crowd is electric. Wait a minute. What did we do wrong? Hey, you, you, got, you gotta you gotta feel the crowd. You gotta feed off that energy. And guess what? Just like you guys were saying, it doesn't. Uh, was it dissipate? Yeah, it never really goes away. It just you know it goes from you to them and them back to you. It's uh, it's really cool. It is is a really cool uh, analogies that he gave. And like I said before, I like the way he explained things because as you alliterated, he explains things a lot differently than other people do. And I think that's what makes him unique and going on 16 years in the business. He's done seminars, all these things. He's a big fan of camp league frog. So are we big supporters of camp league frog. I know you're a huge supporter of camp league frog as well. And, and cheeseburger, he, he went ahead and he threw some shout outs to him as well. And so many different people, that he has grown from their association. And I think that's really cool. Yeah, uh, man, Camp Leafrog is, is a is a lot going on. You know what I mean? We had Grey Wolf there a couple weeks ago. We had we had our man, uh, Killian. Yep. And then there's the weekly shout out, Miss Pee Pee Poo Poo. There it is. You know? Pee Pee Poo Poo. Honk, honk. Darius Carter, you know, is there. Uh, very good professional wrestler. It's like, you know, full circle. It is. Everybody is connected. So, Indeed. Indeed. Hour two is down. Hour one. two is done. But you know what? We told you this week was going to be a big show. And it's going to be a big show. Because are we done? Not no. yet. No, no, There's no. going to be more. And, uh, well, this guest is, this guy guess is a lot of fun. A lot of fun. Man, it, it was, it's exciting to interact with him, talk to him, chat him up. And, oh, my good Lord, about freaking time. Okay, okay, Freeland. Yeah. Can we get an open? The Liam is now here, so... so Oh, so he's here now. We can start. Okay, yeah, yeah. he must have been busy folding boxes. I understand. So, Ready? Welcome to another episode of Future Stars Now and Front Row Material. I am Mike Friel, and I'm joined as always by my broadcast colleague, The Rit. Man, we got a great show for you tonight. This is going to be more fun than you've ever had with pants off. We got great guests coming up. And if you haven't caught all of the stuff we've done so far, you can definitely go ahead and go over to a YouTube channel and you can catch all of our episodes, all of our video episodes that Mr. Liam uh, Savage has put together for us. It is youtube.com. I believe it's forward slash FRM. I believe that's not a good open. Shut your mouth. It's a great open. 
Uh, go ahead and support us on our YouTube channel. We have all of our videos. If you haven't got a chance to see them, you can also go ahead and follow and subscribe to our Twitch channel as well. Um, all the programs are going to be on there. In fact, this one will be on there. <laughs> I keep looking over at the chat, you bastard. Uh, you can go ahead and catch all of these on demand as well as soon as we go off the air tonight. You'll be able to watch this all over again. Who joined us in hour number one? Our good friend, Johnny Moran. Or Moran. You and the fanciness. Look at you and the fancy of the schmancy. My goodness. Um, Johnny had a lot to say. I loved the interview with Johnny. Johnny is somebody that I really feel pretty confident he'll come back again. What will you say? Uh, we were just chatting a little bit. Uh, he loved it. He's going to sit there and uh, hook me up with, with a little something, something for next week's three-year anniversary. Wow, that's going to be a big deal. Three-year anniversary, guys. We are celebrating three years of being on the air, the Front Row Material brand. Um, we're really going to try to do this up and, and give back to everybody who's given so, us so much love over the years. Um, and then obviously in hour number two, we had gray wolf Raventhorn. Um, if you get a chance, please go ahead and follow him on social media as well. You can DM him, get eight by tens t-shirts. He has merchandise as well. Please, by all means support him as well. Are, are we going to, are we going to say now what's going to happen in hour number three? Hey, hey, are you ready to go to church? Oh, I'm ready. Are you ready to go to church, Freeland? I'm hitting my knees. Can we get an amen? Amen. Not yet. We can take a commercial. We're going to take a quick commercial break, and when we come back... <laughs> not going <laughs> to say anything. Not going to say anything. You're no. Hey, it's not going to be, it's not gonna be uh, Reverend Devon. Okay, so for everybody who's watching right now who thinks in hour number three we're going to be have um, Reverend Devon, uh, it is not going to be Reverend Devon, and it's not going to be John Paul II either. Um, and who's the current uh, guy in, in charge of the, the Catholic Church? What's his name? Mike Freeland. No, no. What is his name? Freeland, you should know this. W wow, I should know this. Yes, you don't you, Jimmy Swagger. That's, a, that's, that's Liam. Jimmy Swaggart. Oh, I know. I know. Francis, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much. Oh, man. What did he say, Peter? Pop off? You're, wow. <laughs> that's it. You're donezos. Do oh, throw man. it to commercial. We're not doing Joel Olstein, get out of here. Hey. This is terrible. We'll be back right after this commercial break. At least one of us will be. Where am I going? You Alive Charity is a nonprofit organization founded by professional wrestler, the Pope Elijah Burke, a college graduate and former Jacksonville Sheriff officer who is a native to Jacksonville, Florida. The mission of the Love Alive Charity is to give back to the community while aiming to improve the quality of life in greater Jacksonville. Since 2012, the Love Alive Charity has positively influenced many people by feeding the homeless, helping displaced families, and restoring faith in disadvantaged communities through humanitarian efforts. Hello, I'm Elijah Burke. With as little of a donation of $1 or more, you can help make a difference in the lives of others. To donate and to learn more about the Love Alive charity, please visit the ElijahExpress.com. And we're back. And now as for the uh, the main event here, we have a former WWE, TNA, OVW, NWA uh, superstar here. He is by far one of the most charismatic men in the industry. But also over this past week, reading up on him, he is also... One of the most caring and humble men that you will find. He is the Pope. What to do, man? What to do, Rick? How man. You doing? All right. How are you doing, Pope? Wonderful. Wonderful. Just came off of uh, 
loop here, if you will, with NWA Power. Uh, just finished doing By Any Means Necessary in Oak Grove, Kentucky. So uh, everything's on the up and up, man. Healthy, you know, here, live, if you will, on the front row. Yeah, man, I, I sit there and uh, I was watching the NWA Power before, uh, you know, COVID and everything. And, man, it seemed like it was picking up. It had, it had the momentum. And then all of a sudden, you know, everything shut down. Yeah. So, 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 how was it uh, when you were there with no crowds and everything? Like, like, how different is that going forward when you're used to having that crowd reaction? I think it was. I, I, I think it was obviously a very interesting time for all of us in the world of professional wrestling. I also believe that uh, professionals are indeed accustomed to empty arena matches because that's how we train. Uh, <laughs> we train in empty arenas and we've oftentimes been taught, certainly myself, I should say, uh, that you got to have that crowd mindset, if you will. You got to have that in your mind. You got to have the crowd noise. You got to react in the empty building as if the crowd is there. Uh, you got to act as if the announcers are talking. You got to be, uh, you got to cover all of those grounds with or without a crowd. But certainly it's definitely different uh, when you're used to it and you're accustomed to it. It's, it's somewhat of a challenge. Yeah. Uh, going back, you know, what got you into professional wrestling? You know, a lot of people we talk to, it's like, ah, my friend was into it. You know, my mom and dad were in it, my gram. You know, so so what got you, what caught your eye with professional wrestling? Uh, well, well, probably half of what's catching everybody else eye when they look behind you. But no, <laughs> uh, certainly um, it was real simple, man. Uh, Saturday mornings, sitting next to my dad who was in this big chair or recline or whatever you call it and watching WTBS. And uh, we watched we watched so much wrestling. Every I mean, every Saturday morning, you had a uh, uh, NWA Power. Ain't that something? NWA Power, and here I am. That's crazy. Power Hour. Uh, yeah, yeah. NWA full, Power Hour. Full circle. Full circle. So you know uh, that moment when the American Dream Dusty Rose reached out and said, "Your hand touching my hand. Touch the touch the TV screen right now." Man, I was reaching. I was reaching. So um, all of that, man, uh, uh, parlayed in, in, into what we have now when it comes to uh, the Pope. You know, every Sunday, I'm, I'm from Jacksonville, Florida. Obviously, everybody knows that. And, you know, we getting out of church, you know, uh, you know, get out of church around about 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock. We go to Grandmama's house. We're going to eat some good old soul food. And then we're waiting for 6.05, 6.05. 6.05. We're waiting, man. We're waiting. So uh, all of that. And, and on 605, for those of you who didn't know, that wasn't just on a Saturday. That was on Sundays as well for the main event. So that's kind of that's kind of what got me here. Man, I kind of miss those days of you know, not everything's 6 o'clock, 8 o'clock. No, it was 605. 605. That was the real lead-in to, to what was coming on next. Uh, I spoke with somebody. Uh, when I was at the uh, Oak Grove event uh, for By Any Means Necessary, I spoke with someone and they asked me about baseball, you know, because you got the, the, the World Series going on right now, about to take place. And, um, you know, who's my favorite team? Well, I'm not really a baseball guy, but who I support, the Atlanta Braves. Why did I support the Atlanta Braves during my upbringing? WTBS. If after wrestling went off, you went straight into baseball. Straight into baseball, and, and, that, and was the, that was the only baseball team I was familiar with. So when it was time to play video games, I chose the Atlanta Braves. And, hey, and that was back when you had what Glavin, Smoltz, you know Maddox, Ma Maddox, and there's one Chipper, Chipper, Chipper Jones, Chipper Jones Andrew Jones. Yes, sir. Man, that that was a that was a nice little little time for the Braves. Yeah. Sit there. So, uh, getting into wrestling. So, what was going through your mind? Of you know, did you think you could do it? You know, how do I transfer into you know doing professional wrestling? 
Well, I mean, it, you you go back. Um, I, I think anybody that's a wrestler, uh, a wrestler today was a wrestling fan. And being a wrestling fan, you oftentimes imitated what you saw, that what you're a fan of. I don't care if it's basketball, football, whatever it is that you grow up watching, you try to emulate it. If you were a fan of Michael or Magic, then when you were on the court, you were trying to shoot like Michael and pass like Magic. So certainly um, that was something that was a often, uh, uh, I can't say backyard because the backyard wrestling wasn't really a thing. Uh, I should say, but we did wrestle, whether it was in the pool, whether it was, you know, on the couch, in the bed. Um, so being af athletic, of course, I knew it was something I could do. The question, uh, after going through law enforcement and, and after going through amateur boxing, you know, uh, the question now is, can I do it? in such a worked way, uh, such a worked manner. I wasn't worried about getting over. I wasn't worried about uh, connecting with the crowd. It's something I've always uh, been able to do, you know? So I wasn't worried about that, uh, but I was worried about whether or not I can keep these hands, you know, from going full force and whatnot. Yeah, especially uh, uh, your amateur boxing background, you know, Amateur record over a three-year time, 98 and one. Yeah. Yeah. That's like, you know, now I sound like Hogan, sometimes twice in one night, brother. So, uh, yeah, um, it, it speaks for itself, you know, and I, you're talking about from amateur boxing all the way into the world of tough man boxing as well. I did it all, everything except bare knuckle. Uh, and then could you explain to the audience what the difference between amateur and tough man boxing is? Yeah, the difference between amateur and tough man is amateur is regulated and tough man pretty much isn't. <laughs> that's that's for, for you know, put it in a nutshell so I don't go on a tangent here of trying to explain everything. Amateur is regulated. You got all, of course, tough man had certain regulations, but uh, being, you know, Pope's a easy are, are soaking wet, I should say 180 pounds, but I was still the big guy on campus. So uh, the big guy has to fight the big guy. And, you know, the big guy could be 230 pounds, but they match you up as, hey, you want to fight? This what, well, we got to fight. Yeah, let's fight. I'll take them on. So I always had to fight the guys that were the biggest guys on campus. So that's the difference between a uh, tough man and, and, and amateur boxing, because again, in tough man boxing, and I still went on a little side path here, but tough man boxing, uh, uh, if you want to fight, you, you can fight. If you want to back out, you back out. But if I want to fight somebody, somebody smaller than me want to fight me and it's agreed upon, then, then you go ahead and, and, and you fight. Now, registered hands, we're going to sit there and call them as, as they are registered hands. Going into the professional wrestling, those are, how do you sit there and go to pull, you know, pull a punch, you know, when, when your mindset and your, you know, body's telling you, this is what I've done for this long. Now it's like, nope, we can't be doing that. Right. It was a, it was really a tough transition. Um, it was tough. Uh, much like I said before, getting over that hump. How do you how do you pull them? How do you uh, get past the, the 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 real force of what you deliver? You don't throw them. So um, much like guys today who can't throw a punch, they don't throw them um, because they don't know how to throw them for one, and they can't throw them and make them look good for two. Uh, so they just stick with throwing forearms, and half of those don't look believable. Sorry, you know, Pope's a teacher at heart still, so I, I'm going to go. But nonetheless, um, yeah, I was throwing forearms, but I was practicing my punches until I could throw them in a way that were still convincing and look good and did not uh, uh, negatively affect where I've come from as far as people views. If I'm a boxer and that record everybody knows, then certainly when I throw a punch, it needs to look that darn good. Kurt Angle, 
Olympic gold medal. And so when he goes to the mat wrestling and Greco-Roman style, his has to look better than anybody else's. And so I take much pride. So when Pope throws a punch or Pope throws his, his, his combos or when Pope throws the, the uh, four up uppercut, then you better believe it's going to, it's going to be on point. Hey, okay. I was going to bring that up a little bit later, but four up, you sit there and you, you wrote that on your on your wrist tape. What what was that all about? Undertaker. Uh, I, I was going out there just with the right hand taped up. Obviously, I'm a right hander. Obviously, I won uh, most of my fights by knockout, and it was by the right hand. So um, I would tape it up. And so initially, I was just going out to the ring with the tape on. And one day, uh, Taker pulled me aside and he said, hey, man, um, he said, I, I love what you're doing. I, I love your look. I love you. But he said, uh, find a way to make that personal, uh, make that yours. Because a lot of people has come out and they take their fists or if they're going to have a street fight, they take them. But I'm out there every week. So he said, Find a way to make that yours, um, uh, kind of like how he did with the gloves, you know, when he started. Yeah. Find a way to make it yours. I, he said, I can't tell you what it is. I don't know what to tell you, but you, you figure it out. And so I said, huh, what can I do? And so um, I ended up going with the four up. I thought it was it had a cool sound to it. And then more importantly, it just made perfect sense for a boxer to put four up uh, because when you hit someone with your fist, as Fred Sanford used to say, and all the people back up in, in the older days, how would you like five knuckle sandwiches upside? Your, well, you don't hit a person with five knuckles. You hit them with one, two, three, four knuckles. So it's four knuckles upside the head. So that's where a four up comes from. Man, uh, I sit there and I, I read that story uh, that article that you were talking about, and I'm like, man, I never, I never thought about that. Like, you want five knuckles, but no, just like yeah. you said, you're not hitting them with. If you can hit them with five knuckles, you're something <laughs> special. You're something <laughs> right. special, right? So it's five upside the head, man. They're, 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 and then on the flip side, you know, there, there, there's more to it, but that'll be in the book someday. There, there's actually an alternative reason to it as well, but um, that'll be in the book someday. So uh, you went and you're in OVW. You were, you were down there for a while. And I heard and I read somewhere that they they gave you an opportunity. Spirit yes. Squad, right? Yep. <laughs> so most people, when they have an opportunity to go up to the main roster. Jump on it. They're going to jump on that. And we're going to figure out when we're up there. Right, right. Yeah. But the but the Pope, Pope says, Whew. nah, I'm going to pass on this. Right. Give, me ne- give me next time around. Right. So, so what What was the the, uh, the thinking behind it? Was it something that – Long term. Long term. Oh, I'm okay. Long term. I, I, I knew that Im- instantly Vince told us, me, uh, Nick – Nimeth, uh, Ken Doan, and Nick Mitchell from that MTV series, the reality show, whatever he was on. Vince told us we were going to make a lot of money and and and, and a, lot, a lot of money fast. A lot of money, pal. He told us we were going to make a lot of money. He, he told us this is not from the writers. This is my idea. You're going to be with me. You're going to um, but I was thinking long term. I'm like, eh, you know, all my life, all my life, I wanted to be a, a wrestler. All never dreamt that I would get the WWF slash E. Never thought of that in my life. And here I am, and I'm not. This is just not the way I want to be portrayed. Sure, I'll take anything you give me, but this. It's going to be hot for a moment, but it's going to fizzle out. What what happens after? It's like the night after or the morning after, I should say. What type of regrets am I going to have when I leave that club or that, you know, take that girl home and, uh, you know, and, uh. so so that's 
that was on my mind. And um, I always give a shout out to my boy Dolph Ziggler. He went back down to FCW, WWE de developmental at the time. He found a way to stick around, reinvent himself, and make it work. But the, the rest, just they packaged them up, shipped them back to OVW, never to be heard of again. Ken Doan had a moment, but could not wash it. The stench of the Spirit Squad would not be able to be washed off. So when I think of the Spirit Squad, I think of some of the uh, 80s characters that just came and you just could never escape the 90 characters, I should say, that, you know, T.L. Hopper, you know. The you goon. You just can't, yeah, the goon. Once that happened, they, they were done. You could not, it, the goobly gawker. Once they came, you know, their career was over. And by me being uh, somewhat of a wrestling historian in, in my own mind, uh, because I followed it from, from, ch from youth, from childhood, it's like, no, this is going to be what they're going to be remembered by. And again, Dolph was the lucky one. And not too many people sit there and can say, hey, I, I told Vince no. Yeah. And, uh, well, I, again, here's the cool part about that. It wasn't just a, no, I'm not going to do it. Vince wants you, he wants you to be full in, all in, 100%. You know, there's a reason that Eric Bischoff went back and then got fired because he's not going to be all in in that way that Vince, Vince wants to, wants to call you at three o'clock in the morning and you better be up with a cup of coffee Get out of bed. Stop what you, you know what I'm saying? You're in the middle of sex. Oh, God dang, pal. We got business. You know, stop sexing your wife. Get up. And, and, and that wasn't Eric Bischoff. He, he hadn't, from Eric Bischoff's mouth, by the way, he just was not wired like that to where you got to be thinking. I mean, look at, look at Hunter. Hunter married into that family. He has to be all in. Yes. This wants you to be like him have his mindset and so he told if, if, if this is not you if you not going to be all in on it i don't want you to do it because you're going to do you're going to do yourself a disservice but more importantly you're doing me a disservice so i don't want so yeah so i had i told you know i told him thank you but no thanks and he, he looked me in my eyes and he shook my hand and said he appreciated me for being honest and said Thank you, and uh, we'll send you back down to OVW. I'm always, uh, every time I talk about him, I talk like him, but we're going <laughs> to send you back down to OVW, and we'll bring you back up um, when we get something for you. And they did. Yeah, and it was and it was more, uh, you know, more of you. More of me. More of me. They, they, they sit there and they, they packaged you and teamed you up with uh, Sylvester, and, you know, the whole gimmick was, your amateur boxing background, something that, you know, people knew you as, you know, those hands and, you know, you got your foot in the door and, you know, that was, that was more of you, which is something that everybody says when Vince, you know, gives you a character, it's you, but turned up a thousand degrees. Right. And that spirit squad of that, there's no way that, yeah. I mean, uh, I would have got over. I'm not worried about that. I'm just worried about getting over for the wrong reason. You got three white guys and one black guy. There you so, go. So <laughs> you, you get up on the main roster and, you know, you're in tag team, you're in singles action for a while. And then all of a sudden, the infamous ECW comes back. And, and Vince actually, you know, goes live and tells everybody, Elijah Burke is going to be the face of ECW. You know, you had the look, you had the charisma, the mic skills are to this day still untouchable. Appreciate that. But, you know, what was it that Vince didn't want to give you the keys to the kingdom? You know, it, it seems several times that, you know, he give you, gave you the car to take out around the block. Yeah. But all of a sudden, he's like, ah, it's starting to rain. Let's, let's get the car back in the garage. I, I, you know, your guess is as good as mine. Um, 
I, I was there for a specific reason. Uh, and um, I knew my reason uh, as far as the hill goes and, and to be the heat getter and um, to be to play somewhat of a father to uh, the guys on top. Once my time, you know, once I was the extreme, it was never, I, I was never supposed to be given the keys, as you just said. I was there specifically for that one angle that was the new breed versus the originals. That's what that was all about. That was to get us to WrestleMania. And 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 and, and then, you know, uh, again, I ha- I've, I've never had a problem getting over. And and so then we start just it just continued and it just continued. And um, you know, I, I your guess is as good as mine as far as I know what was supposed to happen at one point. Um, and I knew I was going to it was going to be me and Chris Benoit. I do know that. You know, after Benoit and Punk, I I, I knew I was going to be there. Um, and had I been there on that unfortunate day, which I'm glad I wasn't, because um, I wouldn't have wanted it like that. But they, you know, where, where's Elijah? Well, Johnny Ace had me stay home because after the match with Benoit, my back exploded, and um, he wanted me to get rested up because they needed me. And had I been there, I, I would have been the ECW champion because Vince likes to have the face to chase the heel. Uh, after WWE. You know, you, you play around in the indies a little bit, overseas. And then you, you go and get a shot at TNA. Your uh, your tryout match was against, as we know him now, the chairman, Sean Spears. So what was the tryout match like, you know, going to TNA compared to, I've been at the, at the big show WWE? Easy. Easy breezy. Uh, one thing that I always try to tell people to do is when I'm training guys, when I'm giving guys advice, just like I had some uh, young guys uh, up at the uh, recent event with NWA, you gotta you gotta get your character over. Who 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 are you? Who are your character? What does your character do? What's your, you know, everybody comes out. Someone could come out dressed like the Swamp Thing to this day. Come out just like the Swamp Thing, and and yet there's no, you don't spew any black, you know, mist from, you know, from whatever. Mm-hmm. You can come out just like Dracula, but you're not biting anybody on the neck. Like you have to get your character over, and that's one thing that I always always have done. It's just not the wrestling, and that's what I did there. It was great. The crowd ate it up, and I went backstage and. I remember Jim Cornette going, hey, what are they going to do with you? First, they're going to have your baby face, or you're going to be a bad guy. I don't know anymore. This is driving me crazy. Uh, Jim Cornette. So, uh, but it, it was a wonderful experience. But then I, I gave that uh, DVD. Uh, I had a little promo. It's got to be somewhere. I don't know where it's at. I'm sure I have it tucked away. I gave it to Vince Russo. I said, he was walking by. I said, Vince, say, I got something. I want you to look at this first because, you know, Jared. Already told uh, we got to resign you. Terry Taylor, I met Terry Taylor's yeah. like, you know, I uh, got to get with you about this contract. I say, Vince, I said, I want you to look at this real quick. It's just three, three and a half minutes long. Check it out before y'all decide on what you want to do with me. This is what I was working on with WWE. This is what I wanted. Okay, he's all right, bro. I'll, I'll check it out, bro. He took the DVD immediately. He really did. I, I wasn't expecting, I was expecting a get back with me later he went he put it in the office he came fast walking back out of the uh uh office and he's like bro bro you gotta be the pope bro forget about elijah burke bro you gotta be the pope because the pope is money bro it's my already have the name bro the narrow because the narrow pope means money the pope is money go tell them just forget don't worry about it you do pope and, and i've been pope ever since hey and i love that gimmick i love the character like i'm like man if this was allowed when you were in wwe man i was trying man they they but they they wanted me to be this 
televangelists. And, and I'm like, no, Pope, the only thing religious about Pope is the character. You know, it, it, I, I meant the name, excuse me. The name is the only thing that's religious, if you want to go that route. But um, they wanted me to be hellfire and brimstone and all that other stuff. And I'm like, if somebody wanted to go to church, they go to church. They hear me in a tank. They don't want to hear about that. And I and that's not what I because I, I am a religious person as far as my beliefs go. I, I believe in higher power and all of that stuff. So I'm not trying to get out there and and you know make fun of that or whatnot. But a little tidbit for you, my first feud was going to be Kane. Oh man. That, SummerSlam. Man, that 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 would have been great in my opinion. Pope Mobile and all, they wanted to set me on fire. <laughs> wow. But, uh, you know, so what was the locker room atmosphere like compared to, you know, I mean, the structure wise compared to WWE? No comparison. It, 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 it was like being at the park with your family, uh, you know, some over here fishing, some uh, laying on, the, on a blanket, you know, with their loved ones. It was it was beautiful. Now, was, now, yeah. now you were there at TNA two separate occasions. Under, I'm, I'm, if my memory serves me correct, under two different regimes. Eh, Dixie was still in charge. D Dixie was still in charge, but then I think the second time you had Eric was there, right? No, the first time it, it, Eric was bought in, him and Hogan, while I was there. So Eric and Hogan came in in 2010. Um, I was already there in 2009. You know, I, I, I went towards the end of eight, but, you know, really was there in 2009. Uh, no, 2009 is when I went. I take that back. But nonetheless, uh, Eric and Hogan were brought in. When, when I went back, though, if you're talking about who was, as far as running the show underneath Dixie, that was John Gaborik, uh, big, who's now back with the WWE. So w w was there any differences, you know, for from uh, first time there to the second time? I, I, well, I mean, it, it, it wasn't what it was. I mean, you're talking about you know, three years later, two to three, yeah, three years later or so. Uh, but everything was pretty much the same. You know, every, everything was pretty much the same. I mean, you're not talking about ratings and all of that stuff being the same, but it was still, as far as the locker room atmosphere goes, family-wise, as far as the boys still being the boys, helping out each other, it was still the little engine that could. And, and so I, I enjoyed it, you know? And... Another thing that I see that you enjoy commentating was that always been something that you wanted to do? I think it's an I think it was a natural selection. So um um no, we were discussing a return. It just so happens that Taz had just bounced. So in that in that contract uh, or in the money toss, it's like, hey, well, how about this? You know, Taz just left, you know. You'll be good on commentary. You ever, uh, yeah, yeah. So they brought me down on Mother's Day uh, 2015, I believe it was. He had a pay-per-view going on, our Mother's Day weekend, whatever. And um, I, I, I did a little they, – they were taping, I think, and I just did a little something. Uh, and that the rest was history. Josh Josh enjoyed me. Uh, Josh Matthews, that is. John Gabor enjoyed it. You know, and we have fun and, and you know, it was great. It's something I I always, even to, even now, I want to transition uh, when my time in the ring is up. I want to transition into another aspect. I, who don't want to have all that stuff underneath your belt? You know, you, you don't you you want to be able to do this, do that. You know, I've, I've, I'm, I've wrestled, I've managed, I've commentated i produced i have my own shows you know uh in 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 alignment with my charity which we'll talk about i'm sure but it's it's been great and i i certainly enjoy doing that think bobby heenan think mr perfect think macho man jesse ventura and the list goes on and and, and there's one thing that you all have in common is great charismatic personas and and People sit there and believe what you say because ha it's how you bring bring it across to everybody. Right. And, and, and that's that's always a key part because we've been in the ring. And so that's what a color commentator does is to 
try to inflict or inflate, if you will, their voice in such a way to get over what is being said, whether that's the action in the ring or whether that's some other stuff that needs to be, uh, act, you know, uh, conveyed in a certain way, a certain manner. So that's always been good, man. That's, again, you're making me miss commentating. I love commentating. I, I really love it for a lot of reasons. You know, people thought I was retired. No, Pope wasn't retired. I'm getting paid to commentate. Shut up. I'm, I'm good. Yeah. Well, Pope, this is the last wrestling question that You're I'm good. going. I'm going to ask you. You're good. I'm. 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 In, I'm, in, I'm enjoying. I'm enjoying the conversation. Hot tub time machine. I ask this to everybody. Okay. If you can go back in the time, Dusty Rose. Okay. <laughs> go ahead. To- question to any match uh, in history uh uh-huh. take somebody out and put the pope in that match what match would it be so so i'm guessing it it's someone taking on dusty yeah yeah that, you know the, the only the only the only crazy part about it uh would be the fact that dusty's a face and pope is probably i mean i'm either or but um, being that he's inspired me so much, I would have to get some of my dusty stuff in on dusty. So, but no, I, that's the only thing that I've always wished. You know, if I had that moment, so that's why I immediately said dusty. Rose. I didn't know your question, but I kind of knew where you were going. Uh, but outside of dusty, I, I, I should say I've had my chance to be in the ring with Rick. So it's dusty and Rick, right? So, but I've had my chance being a ring. If I could remove one person to have a full match with, it will be Sean, Sean Michaels, remove him, or Randy Orton, remove him. But Sean Michaels, uh, SummerSlam versus Hogan. Ooh, that is the first time I ever had that answer. Well, it's for a lot of reasons. Uh, we all know what happened in that. If you're a true wrestling fan and know the history and everything that was going on, uh, that matchup could have been, it could have been, it could have been the next Hogan versus Rock match. It was billed as such. Mm-hmm. It didn't live up to such. No. Because of the shenanigans. Because of the tomfoolery that was going on. You know, and so therefore, I, you know, I... I, you know, I obviously I'm no Shawn Michaels though, so I couldn't get in. The, I couldn't have a chip on my shoulder for whatever reason. So yeah, I, I would have been in there selling my butt off uh, for Hogan. But uh, yeah, I mean, but there's so many more that you can go to. But just off the top of my, my mind, that, that that would be the match. Uh, I love it. I was it's- supposed to. I was supposed to get my. my uh, and this is from a fan point of view. All right, this is not who I can have the best match with and all. No, I'm just from a fan point of view, uh, because I was supposed to work Hogan at uh, 10, 10, 10 in Daytona Beach, Florida for TNA's Bound for Glory. Me and the, uh, Sting and Kevin Nash against Hogan, Jeff Jarrett, and Samoa Joe. Uh, Hogan obviously got his back surgery, and that just took everything. I was like, man, why couldn't you just wait? Why couldn't you just wait? You know, but... Uh, that that's that's the one that got away from me. Oh man, that's that's crazy. What could have been? Yeah, yeah. I mean, brother Pope would have sold that boot like nothing else, man. Uh, I would <laughs> I would have took two flips, and Hogan wouldn't have had to do much. He could he could have just raised it to mid. He could have raised it to Pope's midsection, and I would have made it hit my face. <laughs> I got you, Hogan. Oh man, <laughs> and 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 you talking about uh you know Dusty. Man, I, I can see it now. The common man. Oh God. Oh, the the the, the plumber's son. Yeah. Take it on the Pope. Yeah. Oh man, man. that it, that it, is money. Yeah, brother. It, it it it's always the yin and yang. You know who's the yin, who's the yang. But when you got two charismatic individuals, two yingers in there, what can be done? You know because. Even as a face, Dusty did some heelish things, uh, uh, and I'm telling you because I I, I watch I, I watch all of this stuff. I've st- he's done some heelish stuff as a, a, a as a as a face. So, but he's so charismatic that the people ate it up. 
they ate it up. You know, when he would do the heel stuff on the Tully Blanchard, he'd do the heel stuff, you know, just to get back at them. And, oh, so yeah, Dusty, if I could have just took one of his bows, man, I would have been good. Man, if you sit there and thought, like Dusty was in the perfect spotlight right then. He had the horsemen. Yeah. The, yeah. The, the, those yeah. horsemen made him the ultimate baby face back Absolutely. Then. You know, you had Telly, Arn, Flair, Ole, you know, and, and then Dusty, Dusty just rotated his friends in, you know, he to go against never, them. He was never more over than that era, in my opinion. There were, not when he beat – uh. When he won his first world title, no, he was never more over in Pope's opinion than when the horsemen were there. Man, I remember, what was it? I think it was Arn's podcast I was listening to at one time. And they were talking about when they went and the horsemen came in to lock the cage with Dusty. Oh. And with Dusty and, yeah. and, and Arn sat there and everybody, all of a sudden all the fans just went to the cage. And, yeah. and Arn, Arn's like, how do we get out of here? We want to get out of here, man. <laughs> You know, so he had a way of connecting with the crowd, man. That is just un freaking believable, you know. And and um, I don't try to be Dusty. I, nobody can be Dusty, but uh, Dusty taught me a lot uh, from watching him and then from working with him. Talk about full circle from him becoming hands on. You with me? I got you. You you under my wing now. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine seeing Dusty coming down the hall for the first time and you go, oh, my God. Like, for me, this is it. Here comes the dream. And I go, Elijah Burke, and he goes, get that hand out of my way. Boy, I know all about you. I'm the one that – you here because of me. Go put your bags up. Come back and find me. We're going to make a lot of money. Man. It, it seems like your career – just comes full circle all the way around. Yeah, it's crazy. NWA Power Hour. I know. NWA Power. I know. Crazy, right? Watching the dream, yeah. learning from the dream. I'm the dream, yeah, man. It's like it's like, man, that like like if you can sit there and talk to yourself back <laughs> then, now, man, Ooh. could you sit there and and would your younger self believe? No. Hey, you're, you're going to learn from Dusty. Not a chance. Hey, you're going to be on NWA Power. Not a chance. The, 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 the fact that I got a direct deposit in my pocket right now for a shot at the most coveted, the, the most historical title in all of professional wrestling, the NWA 10 pounds of gold, I never would have dreamt it. Let, let alone holding the title. So uh, we'll see what happens when that time comes. But if you talk about full circle, we just going to knock on wood, if you will. Pope's desk glass. So we just going to knock. I've, I've got the wood over here, Pope. i got the wood <laughs> over here. Okay, Daddy. Yeah. Pope, 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 Pope's a little, uh, you know, Pope has to keep it pimping on all levels. So it's all glass over here. But nonetheless, you know, when you talk about full circle, that, that will be – that that just culminates everything right there. That's it. And man, and speaking of full circle, one last thing here. I when we first talked and sent some emails back and forth, and then I started diving into you, you know, going into law enforcement. Right. Going into, you know, your former corrections officer. Right. Got your got your degree for criminal justice. When and then just didn't get certified. Actually crossed over to the streets uh, in Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, you know, the thing is, you got to have that degree to become sworn in and all that other stuff. But go ahead. But, uh, you know, then reading articles going on on your website, which I'm going to put up right now. And, uh, and, and, and reading the testimonies from people. Man... This Pope character, it's, it's not just a character. This is you. Yeah. You know, you care. Yeah. You know, you sit there and, and you want to help people as much as you can. And there isn't a lot enough people out there to do what you do. No. So let's sit there and talk a little bit about your charity. Uh, what made you start and, and, and when did it start? Uh, well, I'll tell you what, man. I remember being 
when we're talking about full circle, I'm the kid that's walking to the grocery store. You know, I'm the one that got selected. I'm, I'm, I'm the baby boy. I'm going to go pick up the milk and cereal while mom's at work. Although I got some teenage brothers that were older than me. But I wanted to go anyways. I wanted to get out the house. I, I'm walking to the grocery store. Mom leaves the money on the counter. I go in to uh, get the food or the cereal. I think I brought Cookie Crisp, as a matter of fact. I'm walking back out. And, you know, to get in, I had to walk through and around some homeless people. And then here this little seven, eight-year-old, however old I was, probably 10, um, I'm walking out and they're asking me for money. They're asking me for change. This is in the heart of downtown Jacksonville, the heart of the homeless community. And, and I never forgot that. I remember having like a quarter or something and a kid giving it to somebody who's on the ground. Here you go. And so um, I always, just growing just growing up, I always said one of these, if I could, being at the bus stop, there's a homeless person, not, not a public transportation, but I'm talking about the school bus stop, and there's a homeless person camped out in the park. So I always say one of these days, man, if I am able to, and then all of a sudden, I'm an officer, as an officer, I'm dealing with a lot of homeless folk that's coming into the uh, jail or transporting them to jail or something, whatever. And then the Jaguars came, uh, you know, this before, but the Jaguars are exploding and, and, and we got all these great things popping off in Jacksonville, Florida, and nobody's doing nothing for the homeless community. And I just said enough's enough. Uh, I may not be able to be the Red Cross or any of these other uh, big charity functions and organizations, but I said, I'm just gonna do what I can do. So uh, right after I left TNA the first time, that's when I, um, uh, uh, around about 2011, uh, I didn't leave them then, but that's when I started what has become the Love Alive charity. And um, all I, we're gonna be on our 10th year this January, uh, January the 8th, we'll have our 10th annual event. Our annual event is our big event. People can go over to Pope TV uh, on YouTube if you want to scroll through and see some of the things that we've done. Well, we have three to 400 people lined up around the block just to get a hot meal. And we feed these people not out of a brown bag. We don't feed them out of a soup uh, truck. We feed them from Burger King. If there's and people line up starting, we usually start at 12. They're, the homeless community, the people in the shelters, and just people in need. Some folk got in line that didn't look like they needed it. I said, hey man, and he wanted two. He wanted two of everything. I said, hey, bro, I said, hey. I said, let me holler at you for a second. I said, and then I said, what, what's going on here? So you, you really, he said, hey man, he said, I just need two. He said, my wife's in a car, she's disabled. He said, come, come with me, you can come see. He said, we're living out of my car. He took me over to his Dodge Charger. His wife is in the front seat, disabled, and all of their belongings are in the back of their car. I said, look, if you need some more, come over. He said, nah, man, this is all. I said, Are you sure? He said, this is, I just wanted to get something for now. So from that moment, never, I've never questioned anybody else. If they stand in line for hours just to get a hot meal, just to go get some clothes, to get some new, uh, to get some shoes that we got, whatever. So I always tell people, look, I'm not, I'm not funded by the government. I'm not funded by the city. You got, we got these big organizations, no knock to you, Tony Khan, but I'm doing for the homeless community. You can certainly donate to your boys charity. We're 501c3. You can write it off. Everybody else, get, come on, man. The only time we see people uh, of, of millionaire status, football players and all these, when they do stuff, it's because it's a national tragedy or a tragedy that's getting attention. Your boy is doing this on the regular. So if you guys are watching and you're listening, all I ask for is you go support your boy, charity at love-alive.org. One dollar help makes a difference. 
One dollar makes a difference. I went to, I'm going to share something and then I'm done. I just passed a guy on the way to Oak Grove, Kentucky. I stopped to get some gas. He was out on the lawn. I said, hey, I'm, I, I went inside to get gas. And I saw him laying out there. He's camped down. He got his radio, whatever. I went over. I said, hey, man, you eat hot dogs? Yeah. I said, what you want on it? Ah, oh, man, I'll, I'll take some mustard and whatever. I said, OK, I'll be right back. Went in. They didn't have any hot dogs. I come back out. I said, look, man. What you want, McDonald's, Taco Bell, or Subway? Because that's what I see right now in the facility. And he goes, why are you being so nice to me, man? Like, it's not my birthday. I said, because I'm just going to take care of you. I believe in changing the world one person at a time. And that's the bottom line. And I took care of him. He asked for a McDouble. I gave him, I went and bought two McDoubles. Got him a large fry. Got him iced tea and whatever. So that's what, that's what my charity is about. We feed. We clothe, we have hygiene products, we have book bags filled with uh, 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 all the accessories for kids to ach achieve academic success. Check us out, support if you can, um, and always remember, one day it could be you. It could be you. Man, I, I sit there and, you know, I went on there and was reading stuff and, you know, it, it this is a great thing you're doing because... You know, how many people sit there and, and walk by and just ignore people? Yeah. You know, like you said, one day that could be you, you know, and someone could be walking by and ignoring you. Yeah. So, so hey, go to love-alive.org. Click on the donate tab. There's a donate yeah. tab at the bottom and yeah. the top of the page. Yeah. Upper left-hand corner of the three, <laughs> of the three little hashtags. Go Scroll down. Go to donate. A dollar will help. Yeah. You know, I know there's at least 500 people that download this episode every week. 500 people sit there and donate a dollar. There you go. And your boy, I, I preach this all the time. And first, before I continue, I want to thank you for contributing to my charity. You didn't have to do it, but you did. So I appreciate you so much, man. And I appreciate you for researching. I appreciate 10 years I've done this. And out of my pocket, I get donate. We got 50 donations on the year so far, okay? But this is still coming out of my pocket, too. Mm -hmm. And I always tell people, I need you because the last thing we need is a GoFundMe. That's when you don't donate, when there's a GoFundMe side up. Come on, help. That's just me. But listen, man, you said it. I got over 45, almost 50,000, I think, followers on Instagram. Can you imagine if everybody donated a dollar? I got a hundred thousand on Twitter. Can you imagine? And we acknowledge every donation, so you know that we're putting it out there that you donated and forty-nine or fifty other people donated. So everything's acknowledged. We're again, we're five hundred one c three. We have to give everything to the state of Tallahassee. We have a board. We got to follow the bylaws and everything, man. So, so yeah. But if I had all those people and everybody that's on Instagram and Facebook, I wouldn't be asking all the time, but I get it. It's hard to depart with your dollar. I get it. That's why I want you to go to the website and see for yourself. Click on the video. Watch it for yourself. Yeah, and, and you sit there and you can learn so much, you know. I, I appreciate you sitting there and coming on the show. You know, I love talking wrestling. Yeah. But then there's that serious aspect where we got to put down the tights, put down the boots. Yeah. And we got to help people. Yes, sir. You know? Yes, sir. So, so hey, post last but not least, for, I, I want to share this cool story because I know they, they don't mind me sharing it. I was at an indie event uh, uh, in, in, in uh, Orlando, Florida. And two, two people that I know have helped. Uh, send a donation. I don't care if it was five dollars or ten. They're married. I found out they were living in their trailer. Uh, excuse me. They got kicked out of their home because the husband had to have back surgery. He couldn't work, so they lost their home. They were living out of their truck with their dogs. Right at the event, since I found that out, Pope stopped the event after my match. I got on the microphone. I'm I'm going to be over here at this table, and each and every one of you who know your boy, 
I right then and there, yeah, I became Pope. I became that black preacher and I took up a collection. And right then and there, we were able to raise almost $400 at a wrestling event for, for them and gave it to them right then and there. So again, man, like I say, it could, we never know when our day is gonna come. So just be good while you can, man. Be the change. Last thing I'm saying, help the Love Alive charity and you be the change that you wish to see in the world. And just like you said, help one person at a time. That's all it takes. Pope, man, I sit there and I love to talk with you. Uh, <laughs> Want to tell everybody where they can find you at on social media to get a hold of you? I appreciate it. At the Black Pope, that's D-A Black Pope, at the Black Pope on Twitter and on Instagram, as well as, again, Pope TV on YouTube. You can watch some good stuff, funny stuff, and the serious stuff involving my charity. Uh, Facebook.com slash Elijah Burke. And of course, watch your boy on NWA Power. But please, guys, the last thing but not least, your boy coming up this Saturday, uh, or assuming this Saturday, your boy's one year at 100th episode, I should say, a Pulse Point of View podcast with Elijah Burke. We are celebrating the 100th episode. Guys, head over to Spotify, Spreaker, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Google Play, whatever. Wherever you listen to this at, you can hear your boy. Pulse Point of View with Elijah Burke, 100th episode. Give your boy a listen. I talk wrestling. I talk the funny stuff as well. And then I talk psychology or wrestling. And I don't hold nothing back. Well, Pope, I appreciate you sitting there and taking some time and stopping by. Any way we can maybe twist your arm to come back at a future time? You better believe it, man. But, you better hey, believe it. You, hey, support, hey. you support Pope's charity. Pope supports you. And it's going to stay that way. Hey, hopefully uh, maybe you can have a little 10 pounds added to you. Hey, if that happens, this is already rolled in. You got me. Oh, man, Pope, thanks a lot, man. I'll sit there and uh, talk to you next time, Pope. Thanks. I appreciate it. Thank you. Man, there we go. The Pope. Oh, guys. Do we want to bring Freeland back? That's the question. No? Okay. Freeland, I hate to tell you, you muted yourself. Your mic isn't connected, it says. Good Lord. It's telling me your mic is not connected. Testing one, two. Is it there, working? There, there we go. This is what happens, Freeland. This is why I had to take you and put you in the back seat. And I had to bring the I got left out of the Pope interview. Yes. Because I pull a Jerry Lynn. And I don't know how to actually work all this stuff. Oh, my goodness. Like, I cannot believe, Freeland. We're trying to be, as our great boss, Mikey Whipwreck says, professional. professional. And what happens? Not you professional. You disconnect your mic. Yeah, I did. That's, that's why I had, to, I had to leave you at the gas station. At no, the, I understand. I had to leave you at the Valeros. Mm-hmm. I get it. But hey, on a on a completely different note, that was a great interview with the Pope. Hey, I loved it. Uh I love that how we talk wrestling, you know, the funny stuff. And then all of a sudden, you know, we got serious because, you know, this is a serious th thing that he does. And, you know, I I made a little small donation, a part uh for FRM pod. And, you know, hey. Keep, keep watching NWA Power because the writ has already got the Pope booked when he brings home that 10 pounds of gold. I like it. I like it a lot. 
And and kind of what the Pope said, even if it's a dollar, you guys, I know times are tight with money sometimes, but if you can, please go ahead. A dollar can be a big deal for a lot of people. Um, so please consider giving to his charity. Once again, it could be anybody that needs the help and one day may need a hot meal or something to help them get along the way. What is this? What is that now? Now you're having issues? No. Okay, I got a Mac. I've got an Apple mouse. And if you take your two fingers and swipe to the right. Whoa, whoa. All you had to say was I had a technical glitch. I don't well, need to know what you're doing back there underneath your table, okay? Swipe uh, left, swipe right. Yeah, geez. So as I was saying before, go to love-alive.org. Um, let's go ahead and let's see how much money we can help raise for uh, the Pope's charity and see how many lives that we can impact. Trust me, my wife and I have gone through some difficult times financially before, and it is scary beyond words. Um, and if there's anything that you can do to potentially help somebody else in a time of need, um, definitely do it. Definitely do it. Because remember, as the Pope said, that could be you. Um, and it definitely changes the perspective on a lot of things. Yeah, uh, I don't. I was talking to the Pope a little bit afterwards, and you know, I don't like telling people a lot of this, but you know, when I was younger, you know, in my twenties, twenty-one range, I sit there and got kicked out of uh, the place I was staying at. I, I have nowhere to go, you know. And I was like that for a good three months. I had a Jeez. job. I had a job, you know. But where I I was going, I went bar hopping. Went home with whoever just to, just to have a roof, you know, over my head. You know, this stuff is real, you know. Mm -hmm. And that's why I was more than willing to sit there and help him out. You know, help out whoever he can. Because, you know, this is just, I live in a rural area. He, he lives in Jacksonville, you know, so we got to start taking care of these people and helping them because they can't take care of themselves. Right. I agree. So. I agree 100%. But yeah, uh, I'm going to leave that scrolling across the bottom of the screen. You know, if you guys, as it's scrolling by, catch it, type it in, you know, and, and just a dollar. That's it. A dollar. Um, I do also want to say something else because uh, I saw on social media that um, someone that we've known for a while, uh, Mr. Mike Cook um, from Mike World Order is having some health issues. And I just want to go ahead and throw my support out there to Mike and to his family. Um, hang in there, man. I know that there's been some health issues in the past, but just understand that you are loved and you are supported. And um, we are here for you. And we hope that things turn around very, very quickly. Yeah, because, uh, man, without Chocolate Thunder, Mike Thunder, man, what would we sit there and do? Pancake batter up. <coughs> Pancake batter, that's right, MWO for life. There you go. So, guys, it's been a great show. It has been a lot of fun. I mean... By all means, when you get a chance, check this out on the replay. Um, great guests, a lot of fun, a lot of laughs. We got serious, and we even talked charities as well. So if you know somebody who's a big wrestling fan and who may even enjoy our show, who may not be necessarily a hardcore wrestling fan, but you know what? They'd enjoy the banter, the back and forth. So let them know about us. All you got to do is tell one friend, and uh, hopefully we can continue to spread the word and get more coverage out there liam savage you son of a bitch you better stop typing in that ch in that chat i'm trying to have a special moment here so hey speaking of special moments next week three-year anniversary show next week three-year anniversary show three years can you believe that three years hey i've only been a part of the active podcast now for six months maybe seven months and I appreciate, you know, every every moment, every time, you know, ever since the day you sit there and ask me to be on. Uh, but I've 
listened since week two, just because Jerry never told me he was doing a podcast week one. Right. So, but next week, I got some big surprises. Freeland. Yes, huge, sir. Huge surprise for you. I can't wait. I, I absolutely can't wait. Um, just tell Kenny um, that after he's in Gorilla, I'm definitely going to want to switch the digits with him and we'll get a hold of him and we'll we'll continue because uh, my, my Kenny's Mikey, the man. Mikey and Jerry are both going to be here next week. Old Fart 1 and Old Fart 2, I can say that. Yes, they will be here live and in living color. There'll be some other people popping on as well. That will that will that will be a tremendous, tremendous thing. Um we've been talking to some other people as well. I have some information that I'll be sharing with the writ as well about next week. But if there's gonna be if there's gonna be a week, definitely check out next week. I think you'll you'll be highly entertained. Hey what was the number one rated segment on Raw for the longest time? What, the longest. The highest rated. The highest rate on Monday Night Raw? Yes. Correct me if I'm wrong. Wasn't it the This Is Your Life with The Rock and, and Mankind? It might have been. Next week? Little, little tidbit, little hint. Could be the highest rated uh, show we've done ever. Ever. This is your life front row material. Three years in the making. Can't wait. We're gonna sit, we're gonna sit and talk favorite episodes, favorite guests, true, favorite moments, and favorite host. <laughs> They only get the they only get uh what three choices? Yeah, I got a thirty three percent chance on that one. Yeah. So hey, we're even throwing favorite panel members. We will. We'll throw in panel members as well because they have been Liam. You are not winning. Just to let you know. Um, I'm I'm gonna have to say this. Uh, the question of Mojo Mojo Riverfish E J Miller. Uh, I I don't know. I don't know. I can't. I cannot confirm that. Um, but evidently he's looking for a plaque. Freeland, I want a plaque for my work. We'll we'll see. You, don't we'll you see. To, don't you have to actually work to get a plaque? Well, no. Here's the thing. Here here's the thing. I actually was giving away those action figures. You remember the action figures I was giving away? The WWE action figures. Yeah. I was I was doing giveaways. I mean, I I was giving away DVDs. Where, how about how about we we also throw out worst contest that never got finished? What, what contest was that? Oh, you mean the impersonation one? Oh. Hey, how about you reach out? We we can finish the contest two years uh, from uh, the date I was supposed to be. God, I tried. I legitimately put my full hearted effort behind it. Hey, if you would have known back then what we know now that you can pre record stuff. Easy peasy. Indeed, indeed, indeed. Thank God for modern day technology. Well, Ritster, it is that time. The time. You hear the music playing? No, we're not playing New York, New York. <laughs> you don't hear that music playing? That's our outro music. Guys, it has been fun. Check us out on social media. You can follow me at Mike Friedland. You can follow the Rit at, oh, here we go, at underscore the underscore writ once yes. again that's at underscore the underscore writ um you can follow mikey whipwreck at mikey whipwreck underscore you can follow jerry lynn at it's jerry lynn um you can follow our panel members if you want to don't know necessarily nope. if you'd want to they don't yeah 86 that one um uh, but that's gonna do it so it's been fun it's been real it's been real fun for the writ, I am Mike Freel, and thanks again for tuning in to Front Row Material and Future Stars Now. <laughs>